The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come with power, with truth, with love. Speak to our hearts your word, Lord God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. This year, with the exception of the season of Lent, we are preaching through the Apostle Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. And the name of the series, as we've said, is called Living from the Cross. And it's because we want to look at the commands that we read in 1 Corinthians, the uh, corrections that we see in 1 Corinthians through the lens of the gospel. You see, if we, if we look through uh, legalistic eyes at these truths about how the Christian church should live, then the burden of these commands, uh, they'll become unbearable for us, and we will become judgmental. Or if we look through these tru- truths with licentious eyes, meaning that we see them as, as outdated, or we see them as irrelevant, or we say, you know, God gives me grace, and I can do whatever I want, well, then we forget that we have been bought with a price. And then the truth of our own sin, it becomes masked, and our need for a Savior starts to become diminished. But when we live from the cross, we acknowledge that you know, all that we all, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God, and that there is nothing that we can do to earn God's favor. And the only thing we can do to God, earn God's favor is simply by believing who Christ says He is. And so there's no room for boasting, and it, it puts us all on the same page as receivers of unmerited and unearned grace and mercy. And that is the posture of 1 Corinthians. Paul is saying to the church in Corinth, look, you're you're acting like you're not children of God. He's saying, you know, you have been adopted, but you're living like orphans. You're living like life is up to you. You're living like you're not loved, and you're living like you have to figure out life on your own. You're living like the forgiveness and mercy offered to you through Christ's finished work on the cross is not enough. You're, you're living like you have to manage your own life as though your hope is in you, as though you weren't bought with a price. Christ's death on the cross, His resurrection, gives, which gives us new life. You're acting like you haven't been given the Holy Spirit, the Counselor. And you're acting like You want to ignore the Christian community who God has given you to love you. When I was 15 15 years old, uh, there was a day um, when my mother disciplined me that I remember the the discipline very, very specifically. I can't remember what I did. But I was 15, so if you've ever had 15-year-olds, I'm sure you can imagine. Um, So I don't even remember what she did. Uh, She had punished me for something, and she had grounded me. She had taken something away, and I had told her that that decision was not right. And I also offered her a few expletives to accompany that. Well, in my mom's response, she gave me a high five 
right about here. <laughs> now, my mom is about five foot tall, and she is a very kind woman. She raised me with appropriate discipline. But this time, I had gone too far. And, and, and in this action, she said a lot to me. Uh, it was like she was saying, you know, wake up, son. Uh, you, you're, you are not who you are. You're not acting who you re- as who you really are. Uh, you're acting like an orphan. I am your mother. I love you, son. You're talking to me like you're not loved, like you're not mine. You're talking to me like I don't love you. Well, that's what Paul is saying in this letter to the Corinthians. Uh, you're, he's saying, you're living like orphans. You have forgotten the gospel. You know, you're living like you have no hope at all. Well, in chapter 6, Paul is addressing the issue of lawsuits within the church community in Corinth. Uh, there were disputes in the church, and they were not handling them within uh, the church body. They were taking their disputes to the local magistrate, and these cases were, were being handled in pagan courts, and it had become shameful for the Christian church and the Christian community. You see, then in first century Christianity, uh, you could have uh, in, in Corinth, you could have these different open uh, areas where they would try cases that you could have, you know, you could have 40 different people on the jury. You could have even more than that. And so these cases were, were very, very public. And so Paul is saying, look, you need to handle these within the church. And in verses 1-5, if we look, we see uh, what Paul, I mean, what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's saying, you know, how in the world can you take your disputes among another? You, you are, you're, you're Christians, you're loved by God. If you look at verse 1, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to the law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? You know, why aren't, why aren't you dealing with these things within the church? Why are you going out in the public and, and handling these cases? Do you not know, verse 2, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? You know, at the at the end of, you know, when Jesus returns, those who are saints, those who are in Christ, will be with Christ judging good angels and judging bad angels. And Paul is saying, look, man, he probably didn't say that, but he said, look, guys, you know, uh, you were bought with a price and you're acting like uh, you're acting like you don't have any hope. You're acting like Christ is not for you. You're acting like uh, you, you, you want to get justice on your own. And it's an embarrassment to what the church community should look like. So Paul continues, and he's, he's talking to the church in Corinth. And, you know, he's saying... This is not how you love one another. I have a friend, and he is a Christian, and he was parked in front of his house, and his neighbor backed out of the driveway. He wasn't looking. He backed up uh, quickly, and he rammed right into his truck. I mean, he just smashed it, and uh, it was unintentional. And my, my buddy, he had some options. He could work out some agreements with the neighbor to have the neighbor pay for the car, he could call the insurance companies and get his just due. I mean, he kind of just, he was kind of do that, right? The guy ran into his car. Uh, I guess he could take the guy to court if the guy didn't want to pay. Well, he made a choice to say, you know, it's okay. 
I don't want anything from you. It's all good. It's been paid for. Uh, I'm done. I'm cool. Well, this neighbor was absolutely beside himself. He was like, what is your deal, man? (laughs) This is not... I mean, the neighbor was saying it wasn't just. (laughs) And he was the one that owed the guy money. Or he's the one that crushed his car. I mean, what a testimony. Do you know what he was saying with, with his actions? He was saying, you know, I have been forgiven with a great debt on the cross, so I am surely not going to hold uh, this over your head. I mean, what if the church acted like that? What a testimony to the world. Now, I want to pause a second because I've got friends who are attorneys. There are friends here who are attorneys. I mean, we need godly women and men to be attorneys. So, uh, that is very important. And uh, I want to also say, you know, there are times when going to court is acceptable. I like the way that Stephen Um uh, phrases it. He says, you know, if this had been an issue like embezzlement, abuse, sexual misconduct, any matter with actual legal ramifications, Paul would have called the intervention of the authorities. The scope of the passage is limited to intra-church disputes that don't need to be elevated outside the community. So I think that's a good definition as we're thinking through that. So let's continue on. Let's look at verse, uh, verse 7. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? I was listening to a pastor uh, this week speak on this passage, and he was telling a story about a leader in his church who is an attorney, and the attorney said, you know, between Christians, most of the time we are able to work out the dispute without going to court, uh, without suing one another, without... um, you know, whatever the ramifications. But in those times when the two Christian parties do not resolve the conflict and they ultimately end up taking it to court, even if they win, even if they win the case, the result is bitterness or guilt or an unsettled spirit. You see, that is why Paul says, you know, don't, just, uh, uh, just let yourself be defrauded. Just let your car be hit. Uh, take the loss and receive the blessing of God. Take Matthew 5 and, and turn the other cheek. Now, friends, I don't know about you, but for me, this is not natural. <laughs> This is not a natural response. I mean, my response, our natural response is like the 15-year-old Stephen. It's not fair. I want justice and I want it now. You will pay. I was talking to um, Al Ward last night at the newcomer's dinner. You know, Al and Gail, they're at the 9 o'clock service. And, and Al was telling me that he... He makes jelly, and he was telling me about making jelly, and it was on the stove, and this one batch he cooked too long, and it started to um, form these crystals, you know, all these crystals in there because he cooked it too long, and it hardened up. Well, if, if, friends, if we don't settle our disputes and we let our bitterness settle in our hearts, it's going to be like that. I mean, our hearts are going to get hard, and they're going to get crusty, and we're going to carry bitterness around with us, and it will eat me, it will eat you alive. We want justice, we want compensation, but ultimately, compensation and justice will happen. Romans 12, beloved, never avenge yourselves. But leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. One day Christ will come, and all wrongs will be made right. But there, friends, 
there is a justice that has already happened. You know, if you're in Christ, there is a justice that has, and a compensation that has already occurred. And we see it in Romans. For our sake, He made sin, He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Christ knew no sin. He was sinless. We um, are sinners and deserve the wrath of God, yet Christ took the punishment you and I deserve so that we might stand before God as though we have not sinned. Now, that is justice, but the justice wasn't poured out on me. It wasn't poured out on you. It was poured out on Christ. And we get the grace. We get the mercy. We get the Holy Spirit to live in us, to guide us. That's why the word gospel means good news. That's why it's called good news. It's free, undeserved. It's a free, undeserved gift given to me and to you. And when we remember, when we believe, when we believe that, then our response is different. Grace starts changing everything. You know, the, it starts to change our marriages. It starts to change the way we parent. It, it changes our conflicts, the way we handle conflict in the church. And we start to love others with mercy and the same grace that has been shown to us. We learn to say, you know, let's, let's work this dispute out. Let's don't take it any further. Let's work this out. You're my sister. You're my brother. Let's work this out. You know, I know, uh, I want you to know, and, and Ron's door is wide open. My door is wide open. If you have conflicts and you have uh, things that you need uh, to deal with, uh, then, then, you know, things that are within the church community, these, these things that, that don't need to be taken higher, we want to walk through that with you. We want to we wanna, we wanna help turn your eyes to Christ. You know, we, We want you to love others the way that you've been loved. When we remember the grace that has been shown to us, friends, it begins to change everything. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father, make this truth uh, not just be on the surface. Lord, anything that I've said that is not of you, I pray it will fall on deaf ears. But anything that is of you, will you preach it? And, And by your Holy Spirit, will you... Just zoom it into our hearts. Make it real. Make it last. I pray that that your grace and mercy, you will put it in our hearts and our minds in such a way that it would cause us to love others with this holy, reckless abandon. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.